today, let's swing some more. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and problem news, and this is our weekly market update. Well, as we move into November, global stop indices swung sharply as the US dollar dropped to a six week low and benchmark 10 year US Treasury yields fell to a five week low on Friday. The catalyst was data showing that US jobs growth slowed more than expected in October, with some seeing this as meaning the Federal Reserve may be done hiking interest rates. <laughs> we'll see. The Fed, the Bank of England, Canada and other central banks have all held rates in recent times while continuing to underscore the drive towards their inflation targets will mean rates stay high for longer and they'll be data dependent. US two-year yields were the lowest since early September after US jobs growth slowed in part as strikes by the United Auto Workers Union against Detroit's big three car makers depressed manufacturing payrolls. The data also showed the increase in annual wages was the smallest in nearly two and a half years, pointing to an easing in labor market conditions. The US dollar index dropped to a six week low after the jobs data and afternoon trading, the index fell more than 1%, with the euro up 1.04% to 107.3. The good news here is that the slowdown will likely keep the Fed on the sidelines going forward, said Bragg McKinnon, Chief Investment Officer at Commonwealth Financial Network. One of their key concerns has been an overheated economy, especially after last quarter's GDP growth, and this suggests that the problem is going away. Traders are now pricing in only a 5% chance of a Fed rate hike in December, that's down from 20% on Thursday, while the odds of a January increase has slipped to 11% from 28%. The RBA, by the way, which meets next week, is currently at a 58 probability of a rate rise, but we'll see. US benchmark 10-year yields fell as low as 4.484%. That's the lowest since September the 26th, and it was last at 4.575%. A decision on Wednesday by the US Treasury to issue less long-term debt than expected also fueled the rally in bonds, as did data on Thursday suggesting the US economy might finally be cooling. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.66% to 34,061. The S&P 500 gained 0.94% to 4,358. And that's that composite added 1.38% to 13,478. The three major US stock indices posted gains for the week, with the S&P 500 registering its biggest weekly percentage jump since November 2022. The shift in market sentiment resulted in the S&P 500 setting course for its best week of the year with a rise of 6%. And the Russell 2000 index of smaller companies rose nearly 3% on Friday after suffering a 18% decline in recent months. Bucking the trend on the broader market though, Apple shares fell 0.5% a day after the company reported quarterly results and warned of a dull holiday quarter. The iPhone maker gave a holiday sales forecast that was well below Wall Street estimates, and at least 14 analysts cut their price targets for the stock. These market movements came following comments from Richmond Federal Reserve President Tom Barkin, who is also an incoming voting member on the Fed's Interest Rate Committee. In an interview on CNBC, Barkin discussed his interpretation of the October employment data viewing it as a gradual step down in jobs growth. This perspective aligns with those opposing further rate hikes, of course. Barkin refrained from making predictions about potential changes in the policy rate at the central bank's December meeting. Instead, he highlighted a discrepancy between the data and the feedback from his contacts within businesses. He noted that while some remain confident in their pricing power, others are exciting caution. And furthermore, Barkin expressed uncertainty over the robustness of consumer spending as indicated by September's retail sales increase of 0.7%. His focus remains on addressing inflation concerns and he does not foresee immediate interest rate cuts. Economists are increasingly confident the economy will avoid a recession, such as due to strong job and retail sales data. Even Jerome Powell, in his recent speech, made note of the strength of the data, saying additional evidence of persistently above trend growth or that tightness in the labor market is not 
easing any longer could put further progress on inflation at risk and could warrant further tightening of monetary policy. In any case, inflation is still too high and a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably towards our goal. Understanding why the economy has done well actually is quite easy. Massive stimulus drove consumption. The difficult task ahead is to forecast how much of the remnants of stimulus and other forms of financial relief will continue to fortify personal consumption and boost economic activity. Given that personal consumption consistently accounts for about two-thirds of US economic activity, it's not surprising that when you send money directly to households, the result would be both a surge in consumption and higher inflation. Three years after the pandemic-driven economic shutdown, monetary liquidity remains highly elevated as a percentage of GDP, and that surge in stimulus-driven demand led to increased job growth, higher wages, and of course, higher inflation. Much like a massive bonfire, that surge in monetary supply ignited economic activity, and it takes time to burn out. As that excess liquidity expires, the rate of economic growth and ultimately inflationary pressure will reverse. As such, what we are currently seeing in the job and retail sales data is not suggesting a more robust economic growth rate in the future. It's just a reflection of the fading economic activity driven by the last remnants of financial stimulus. In other words, we're looking and driving in the rearview mirror. The stability in rates is helping other asset classes to find a footing, said Jason Drow, head of asset allocation Americas at UBS Global Wealth Management. If equities move higher, you may find investors starting to feel as if they need to chase performance through to the end of the year, he said. Drow expects the S&P 500 to trade between 4,200 and 4,600 until investors determine whether the economy will be able to avoid a recession. The index was recently around 4365. Other factors may also be working in stocks' favour. Exposure to equities among active money managers actually stands among its lowest level since October 2022, according to an index compiled by the National Association of Active Investment Managers. That's a compelling sign for all contrarian investors who seek to buy when pessimism rises. Aggregate equity positioning tracked by Deutsche Bank fell to a five-month low earlier in the week, the firm's strategy said in a note on Friday, helping fuel a powerful bounce when investors rushed back into the market. We had an extremely oversold market in the midst of a strong economy, and the Fed coming out a little more dovish was the kindling we needed for a rally, said Ryan Detrick, chief market strategist at Cast Investment Research, who believes the current rebound in stocks will take them past their July levels. Some investors, though, worry that the so-called Goldilocks economy, suggested by Friday's job report, may not last. Red Wilsky, head of US fixed income at Janus Henderson Investors, believes that while signs of soft and expected growth are boosting stocks and bonds for now, they may eventually stir recession worries. Eventually, good moderation will turn into a debate about whether the economy and labour markets are weakening too much, he said. Oil prices, including West Texas Intermediate and Brent for January settlement, saw an uptick recently, following a three-day losing streak. The WTI settled at $80.88 a barrel, while Brent was at $85.17 a barrel. This rebound was attributed to multiple factors, including the Federal Reserve's signals of ending interest rate hikes and a decrease in the dollar value. Another significant factor, of course, was US intelligence reports indicating that Russia's Wagner Group may supply air defence weapons to Hezbollah. This geopolitical tension further boosted oil prices. Despite those positive influences, crude continues to trade below pre-war levels. Fears of regional conflict, disrupting oil supplies and a manufacturing contraction in China are contributing to those lower prices. An agreement between Israel, Egypt and Hamas, allowing some refugees to flee Gaza conflict zones through a Qatar-mediated deal has partially eased concerns, but not enough to fully restore crude prices. And by the way, gold was back just below $2,000 as caution eased a little. 
Now, the Pan European Stock 600 index rose 0.17%, and the MSCI gauge of stocks around the globe was up 1.18%. The MSCI index was up 5.3% for the week. That's also the biggest weekly percentage increase since November 2022. European markets also saw gains following the news from the US with the French CAC 40 up to 7,047. Germany's DAX climbed to 15,189, while Britain's FTSE decreased to 7,417, as significant decreases were observed in the shares of key constituents such as Shell and Compass Group. And other notable companies like by Rickett Beckheiser and Sage also experienced share price declines somewhere between 2.16 and 2.35%. Despite the overall downward trend, some companies did manage to buck the trend with significant gains. Leading the pack was Ocado, which saw its shares rally by an impressive 6.48% again. And that was followed by Persimion and Entain, which saw its shares go significantly higher. In terms of currency movements, the pound did appreciate against the dollar on Friday, gaining 1.45%. In addition, there was a decline in the yield on the UK's 10-year gilt, settling at a rate of 4.3285%. This suggests that investors may be shifting towards safer assets amid the volatile market conditions. European markets saw a positive close on Friday, with Adorsa standing out as its shares surged by an impressive 14.5%, marking a notable event in Friday's trading session. Other companies that contributed to the market's gain included Wiz Air Holdings, Siemens Energy and Galapagos. They each experienced significant share price increases. However, not all companies shared in the upward trend, with Moyamarsk seeing a substantial share drop, and Nova Nordisk, Uniper and Total Energies also experiencing declines. Comments from the ECB officials have been somewhat mixed recently. Klaus Knott acknowledged that interest rates had reached a suitably cruising altitude, while ECB chief economist Philip Lane noted a strong possibility for a soft landing. However, Isabel Schnabel recently stated that while the ECB is on track to push inflation back to its 2% target by 2025, it still cannot close the door on further interest rate hikes. This comes as the Eurozone's October manufacturing PMI indicated a recession level figure of 43.1 and German unemployment increased beyond expectations. In currency markets, both the pound and the euro strengthened against the dollar and that comes as Brent crude prices dipped, potentially relieving some pressure industries heavily reliant on oil for their operations. The German 10-year Bund yield fell to 2.657. This decrease in yield could signal investors increased appetite for safer assets amid market volatility. In Asia, markets responded positively to the Federal Reserve's announcement that Japan Nikkei 225 finished at 31,949 and South Korea's Cosby was up to 2,368. In other developments, Japanese Prime Minister Fumo Kishida announced a $113 billion stimulus package in response to rising inflation and declining public support. The package features tax breaks for individuals and companies, along with subsidies for energy costs. China's services sector grew at a much slower than expected pace in October, according to a private survey, as a deepening slump in domestic demand largely offset some improvement in foreign orders. The Caxing Services Purchases Managers Index, the PMI, grew 50.4% in October, missing estimates for a read of 51.2. The reading accelerated slightly from the 50.2 seen in September, but it still remains just shy of contraction. A reading below 50 indicates contraction in the sector. The week out of October was largely driven by a further softening in local demand, which saw new order growth slow substantially, turning companies more cautious over expanding their businesses. While some improvement in foreign demand aided the services sector, it was largely insufficient in offsetting a decline in local demand. Chinese businesses and consumers have scaled back sharply on spending this year amid increased concerns over a slowdown in the world's second largest economy. The casting survey showed that businesses grew less optimistic about China's economic prospects this year, especially as PMI data released earlier in the week showed an unexpected contraction in the manufacturing sector. The soft PMI readings highlighted the sustained weakness 
in China's economy this year, with economic activity struggling to pick up despite the lifting of the anti-COVID measures at the beginning of the year. While Beijing rolled out a string of stimulus measures in recent months to support growth, they appear to have so far provided only a very limited boost to the economy. That was particularly apparent by weakness in the services sector, which is otherwise a stalwart support of business activity. Still, China is set to issue about 1 trillion yuan, or about 136 billion US dollars, in government bonds this year to spur more infrastructure growth. And that's expected to help shore up some economic activity in the coming months. The Shanghai Composite was at 3,030, while the Hang Seng in Hong Kong was at 17,687. Australia's share market finished on a positive note on Friday, tracking strong gains in Wall Street, as hopes that the Federal Reserve might finally be done with raising interest rates gathered some more momentum. The benchmark ASX 200 jumped 1.1% to 6,978 at the market close, with 10 of the 11 sectors finishing in the black. It's still the weekly gain of 2.2%, the most since September, and the all ores gained 1.1%. Most global share markets rebounded over the last week from oversold levels on the back of increasing optimism that the Federal Reserve has finished raising rates, strong US earnings results, and the war in Israel being relatively contained so far, AMP Chief Economist Shane Oliver wrote in the note to clients. The interest rate sensitive real estate sector jumped 2%, Goldman rose 1.7%, $22.04, Westfield and Santo. 4.5% to $2.58, and Charlie Hall, 3.7% to $9.77. In company news, Macquarie Group shares rallied 1.8% to $163.24, even as it reported a 39% drop in half-year net profit to $1.4 billion. It declared an interim dividend of $2.55 a share, and revenue was booked at $7.9 billion. Property developer Lend-Lease added 1.1% to $6.38, despite news that the company and Google were ending the agreement to help develop the internet giant's four major districts in the San Francisco Bay Area. Afterpay parent block soared 25.2% to 81.18. After it boosted its profit forecast, it estimates adjusted earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization for 2023 in the range of 1.66 to 1.68 billion US dollars. Regal Partners advanced 1.1% to $1.92. The hedge fund acquired PN Capital, the 25-year-old Sydney-based investment firm, in a move that will boost its assets under management to about $10.8 billion. And Penfold's owner, Treasury Wine Estates, stumbled 8.8% to $11.04 after the company completed the institutional component of its entitlement offer. The winemakers announced on Tuesday that it was taking over Deo Vineyards in California. And Qantas shares rallied 2% to $5.18 after the airline held its annual general meeting with a few ructions. Bitcoin's price, meanwhile, briefly eclipsed $35,000 this week, but it was at last at 34780 And meanwhile, FTX claim pricing has reached as high as 57%, according to data from Claims Market. The increase in FTX's claim pricing is attributed to the valuation of the artificial intelligence companies that the now bankrupt crypto exchange previously invested in. This came after Sang Bankman Fried was found guilty of all seven charges laid against him in his criminal trial, just hours after prosecutors laid down their final rebuttal to the defence. Creditors state their claims to try to recoup some of their investment when businesses experience financial difficulties or bankruptcy. Investors frequently trade those claims based on their estimate of the total amount recovered. There is an increase in the estimated recovery value when the pricing of a claim rises. Bankman Free was found guilty of two counts of wire fraud, two counts of wire fraud conspiracy, and one count of securities fraud, one count of commodities fraud conspiracy, and one count of money laundering conspiracy. And he's going to return to court for sentencing in New York on March the 28th. Government prosecutors will recommend a sentence but of course the judge will have the final say. Bankman Freed's crimes each carry a maximum sentence of between five and 20 years in prison with the wire fraud, wire fraud conspiracy, 
a money laundering conspiracy carrying a maximum of 20 years sentence. Open interest in Bitcoin futures reached $3.65 billion on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's a new all-time high. And the metrics suggest that more traders are gaining access to the Bitcoin market through derivatives. In terms of bullish sentiment, there were 122 active large holders involved in Bitcoin futures during the week of October the 31st. That's the highest on record. As a result, the Bitcoin CME futures premium reached its highest level in over two years. Digital asset markets have seen a wave of positive momentum tied to speculation that the US Securities and Exchange Commission is on track to approve its first spot Bitcoin ETF. This may have prompted the largest inflows into crypto exchange traded products in over a year. According to CoinShares, crypto funds inflows were around $326 million last week. But the point I want to make more broadly is that the markets continue to go violently sideways, up and down, up and down, down and up. Nothing has fundamentally changed. The data continues to be a variable. And of course, the speculation continues to remain as to whether the Fed will lift or won't lift. And that will be determined by the information that comes from this point. Meanwhile, in Australia on Tuesday, we get the RBA decision. And as I've discussed in previous posts, there's a significant question as to whether the RBA will be able to be independent and perhaps lift rates, or whether they will essentially be influenced more by the political vibes, which is to keep rates on hold. Just remember, rates in Australia are significantly below other parts of the world, and that our inflation rate is considerably higher. And in the last quarter, the critical core in inflation measure was at 1.2%, which was higher than the previous quarter. In other words, if you leave things as they are, inflation will continue to burn bright. And as we've said for many, many times before, keeping inflation running longer leads to higher rates for longer, which doesn't improve anyone's lot. Therefore, the RBA should lift but whether they will, of course, is a whole different ball of wax. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.